Our first presentation will be by the winner of the Lieber Prize, the first of our several major prizes, which was established in 1987 uh, by Connie and uh, Steve Lieber uh, in order to provide public recognition for psychiatric research on schizophrenia. Um, the recipient of this is uh, Dr. Mark Carroll. Uh, please correct me if I, uh, that he's a uh, Quebecois, is that a fair, okay? Uh, and uh, coming from a small town near uh, Quebec City, uh, Canada, where it's very cold, uh, but the skiing is very good. His father was a small dairy farmer. Um, he uh, received his education at Laval University, which is in Quebec, and uh, then decided to co go where it was a little bit warmer, to the University of Miami, and uh, he got his PhD there, um, and uh, from there uh, moved partway uh, north again to Duke, uh, where he has established a uh, laboratory and been there uh, for many, many years and has done really remarkable work on uh, receptors. So please welcome Dr. Caron to give his presentation. No, that's good. Thank you. Yes, I am a Quebecois. Mm -hmm. I, and I didn't go to Miami to try to follow all the other Quebecois but, because I wanted to work on something specific. So uh, I am delighted to be here this morning and uh, particularly honored to uh, have received the Lieber Prize for, as you, as you all heard, uh, for what it stands. Uh, what I'm going to tell you today, uh, Shotin was worried about how we could, we could get uh, ready, and I said to her, we do this almost every week, you know, we give talks. This is especially uh, challenging for us scientists because we used to talk to all scientists, and so we talk, as you know, in, in lingo. And so we've tried, so we have tried to adapt this, I think, for all of us in, in things that you can understand. So forget us because, forgive us because we, we sometimes will use some graphs and things like this which sound scientific, but we'll try to make them understood to, to everybody. And so uh, before we get started, while you're admiring the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the scenery that is at Duke University, probably in a couple of weeks or so, uh, I'd like to, to put the, the, the talk that I'm gonna give you in a little bit of a, a perspective. Because I don't want you to, to go away from uh, my talk and say, oh, he's looking back to, to 10 years ago. Because of the title that I'm putting here, oh, I'm sorry, uh, is Integrated Approaches to the Development of uh, Schizophrenia uh, Therapy. Uh, if, you, if you remember back about 10 to 15 years ago, when the genomic revolution came, we, many people thought, oh, this is the way that we're going to discover the gene or the two genes or that will cause schizophrenia or depression. There was a lot of hope for this, okay? But as you all know, you have heard, a lot of work has been done. And what has happened is that we've discovered a lot more than what we anticipated. We know now that probably there must be hundreds, if not thousands of variants that will be associated with schizophrenia. So this is a big challenge. It's a big challenge in different ways. It's a big challenge because it's very hard to see how these genetic variants really uh, are dysfunctional in our body. And also it's a challenge because if you think about it, even if we understood how these things work, how are we gonna convince drug companies to develop a thousand drugs or a hundred drugs at the cost of a billion dollars each, okay? So this is, uh, so the question is, should we continue to do this? Yes, we should, because eventually we will discover the silver bullet, okay? Probably by somebody who's not looking for it, okay? So as it happens sometimes in science. So what, what I'm gonna tell you today is basically something that uh, as Bob said, I mean, I've worked on receptors for basically all my scientific career. And what I'm going to try to do is to uh, show you that the overall goal is what we have 
is to try to validate the new concepts for the development of better antipsychotics. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, uh, tell you that the approach that we're using is that we're trying to develop genetically engineered animal models, mostly in mice, because that's doable in mice, that will allow us to map the cellular mechanism, the brain pathways, and the circuits that are associated with schizophrenia phenotype, or the actions of antipsychotics. And some of these animals will be used by many of the people that you'll hear about uh, this morning. So let's, uh, let's uh, I, I put here a, a, a brain, a picture of a brain, a human brain. And as you know, the brain is essentially an electrical box, okay? And the neurons fire back and forth, and that's how it's controlled. The, the systems that controls the firing of neurons are mostly fast neurotransmission and slow neuro or, or uh, stimulatory and inhibitory neurotransmission that use the, the, the compound glutamate or GABA. And depicted here are other systems that I'm sure you have heard about, the dopamine system and the serotonin system. You know that most of this is associated with schizophrenia. This is mostly with, with, uh, with depression. And they have several functions, you know, reward, pleasure, motor function, whereas the serotonin system, mostly for mood, memory, processing, sleep, and <coughs> cognition. Now, these systems are essentially the rheostat or the switch, essentially, to control the fast and the fast neurotransmission in the brain. And they work through receptors, receptors, the type of receptors that I've worked on all my life, essentially. And, and these are essentially, this is what current therapy target. So antipsychotic work predominantly on dopamine receptors, but also on, on, uh, on serotonin receptors. And so the antipsychotic, as summarized here, are the mainstay of the treatment of schizophrenia, uh, and they bind to dopamine and serotonin receptors. So the, uh, we've had the typical antipsychotics, which you probably all know. The interesting thing is that these, ex these typical antipsychotics like chlorpromazine and haloperidol, you know from having been through this, and I'm sure you know all this, is that they have been discovered mostly by serendipity back in the 50s and 60s. And so they're not based really on any of the, 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 the uh, things that we understand about receptors. But you, uh, you know that many of these uh, antipsychotics have side effects. They have extrapyramidal side effects. Uh, a little bit later on, oh, I'm sorry. This is going too fast. A little bit later on, back in the 80s, beginning of the 90s, there were other, uh, other antipsychotics that were developed, like clozapine, but they have side effects because they have like, a, a, uh, uh, like uh, blood disorders. Uh, newer antipsychotics that have been developed, mostly in the last 10 to 15 years, also have uh, side effects like weight gain, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and the most, the most uh, uh, damaging of these of these medications that all antipsychotics essentially uh, are ineffective at correcting the negative symptoms and the cognitive symptoms they don't they don't treat really the core of the disease they treat some of the symptoms so what is the new concept that I would like to present to you the things that we have been doing over the years so I've been as I said I've been working on on receptors for many many years and so it's a class of receptors that very technically is called G protein coupled receptors. I call them GPCRs, okay? So, but they're, they're very pervasive in our body and in nature. So there's about a thousand GPCRs in our human genome. This is how we see, how we smell, how we taste. Every cell in our body contains some of these G proteins. And you will see this morning is that some of these, uh, even bacteria, uh, bacteria and, and algaes have some of these proteins and they sense light with that. And I think Dr. Disroth is going to talk to us about this. And so the, what I'm going to try to develop for you is the concept of functional selectivity or bias signaling. So these receptors are things that are expressed, they, they, they are in the plasma membrane of cells, in the membrane of cells, where they can bind neurotransmitter, hormones, and things like that. And they send a signal, and they activate 
through a change in conformation here through the membrane, they activate these proteins that are called G proteins. That's why they're called G proteins. And they send signals, second messenger, a little chemical signal that elicit the cellular response, okay? Now, we have characterized over the years some of the mechanisms that are involved. We understand how these things function quite well. Now, one of the mechanisms that we studied back in the late 70s is the mechanism by which you develop tachyphylaxis. And one of the examples that you will all resonate with that I will give you is that you go into a bakery, smell bread, or you go into a deli. Here in New York, there's a lot of those. You can smell the very good smell. If you, you go in and you smell this, I mean, it's overwhelming, pleasant the smell. Bad smell is the same thing, too. But at, if you wait at the cash register to pay for a few minutes, the, the sensation is lost. So what has happened in this is that the, the odors that stimulated the, the response here in your nose and then going to your brain have desensitized. And they've desensitized by mechanism that modify the receptors and bind to other proteins that basically block the ability to do this, okay? So what we have discovered over the years is that we have shown that this mechanism is the mechanism by which the signal to get the receptor inside the cells and take them back to the plasma membrane as competent receptors. They get rearranged and reactivated. But then what came as a surprise is that this, this arm here, when the receptors is, quote, desensitized, we all thought that it was a dead receptor, a dead complex, but it's capable of sending a signal on its own. And, but the difference is that this signal is rapid and transient, this initial signal. This one is slow and protracted. It lasts a long time. And for many, for several of the receptors for which this has been characterized, these two things do different things in cells and in, the, in our bodies, okay? So what's interesting about this is that, so we've developed from this the concept of functional selectivity. The reason for this is that we've observed that natural ligands or natural signals that activate these receptors can activate one pathway and block the other or vice versa, okay? So it means that the receptors, different conformations of the receptors recognize different molecules different way and signal differently inside the cells. So, and we have also synthetic uh, molecules that can do this. The other thing is that I just mentioned is that invariably when those two signals are, are done, you can see that they do different things in the cells. So they affect different cellular and physiological processes. So based on this is that we, we have postulated that maybe one could use or leverage this principle to develop compounds, not only for schizophrenia, but there's a lot of other applications because if you, you probably know that these receptors basically are, uh, there's a thousand of them, there's 400 that usually we have in our nose, our, our olfactory system, and there's about 400 that we know have hormones and neurotransmitters that bind to them. These receptors account for about 40 to 50 percent of all the drugs that are on the market, okay? But just, just take that number. Of those 400, only 50 of those receptors are today targeted. So it means there's like 350 for which we, can, we don't quite know what the physiology is, but we could develop new drugs, okay? So it's, it's an exciting time. So what we have done in, in our lab is that we have worked mostly with the D2 dopamine receptors because, as you know, this is the primary target for, for the uh, for the uh, neuro, the antipsychotics. We have developed animal models. We uh, initially developed an animal model that is a, a transporter knockout for the dopamine. Trans dopamine transporter is what clears dopamine from the brain when it's released. And these animals have, they, they have behavior that looks like schizophrenia because they, their, their increased locomotor activity can be inhibited by antipsychotic. We've developed also another animal model which triggers or, or, or uh, basically uh, inhibit the fast neurotransmission by glutamate. It's called, it's an, a, 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 a component of the ion channels that sends glutamate. And these animals are like negative symptoms of schizophrenia. They're asocial. They don't, they don't 
bind to each other essentially. And then this one, we've, this, uh, we've worked with this model because this is the, the protein in which this desensitization of this other mechanism basically signal. Now, what we've basically discovered is that, so we've studied dopamine receptors mostly, and you know that this, in the brain, there's two, about two types of dopamine receptors, D1, which is stimulatory, and the D2 receptors are mostly inhibitory for this signal. And I put down here Dr. Paul Greengard, who has, over the years, you know that I'm sure you, this name is familiar to all of you, uh, he's here at Rockefeller and has gotten the Nobel Prize for some of the, uh, the work that he's done. He's characterized most of this pathway, and, and this, is, this was incredible work that he's done. Now, it, where there's a pathway which stimulates the signal or another pathway that inhibits the signal. What we have discovered based on this functional selectivity using these models, we've shown that there are a path where there's a pathway downstream of the D2 receptors which uses a parallel pathway, something which dependent on the arrestin here, but involves several other, uh, other molecules, so the phosphatase, two kinases, and so on and so forth. That's not really that important. But the evidence that this pathway may be associated with schizophrenia is quite, is quite strong. Uh, Joe Gogosh at, uh, at Columbia here showed many years ago at the time that we discovered some of the evidence for this pathway that schizophrenics in the, the lymphocytes, this white blood cell schizophrenic, there's a decrease in, the, uh, in this AKT protein. There's also variants that associate in cohorts of, of schizophrenics. And so an antipsychotics basically target this, uh, this pathway mostly some, sometimes uh, modifying this, this other enzyme. And then uh, workers, we and others have shown that genetic overexpression of this particular kinase here, GSK3, mimics symptoms of schizophrenia very much to what we found here with the dopamine transporter knockout. And also, we have shown recently, and Dr. Erse has done this, is that deletion of this kinase here uh, does the same thing as inhibiting this pathway. Basically, it, it basically recapitulates the effects of antipsychotics. So there's quite a bit of evidence that this pathway may be involved in the actions of, or in the phenotype of antipsychotic, but also in the actions of, of antipsychotics. So the hypothesis that we've had is that small molecule that show functional selectivity for that particular form of the receptor, the form of the receptor that engages the arrestin pathway, so-called, might be a, a good approach to, uh, to, to develop more effective antipsychotic but with less side effects also, okay? So what we have done, and we've been uh, doing this now with, uh, for the last though, six, seven years with a, an initiative from an IMH in which uh, we at Duke, myself, my lab, and my colleague Bill Wetzel, with colleagues at UNC, Brian Roth and Jan Jin, uh, we have been, uh, we've had a, uh, a large grant, which is in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. Pfizer doesn't get any money from the government, but what they do, they support us. And what they commit to is that if our approach look good, they basically commit to take it to proof of concept, which in academia we cannot do, okay? And it's incredible how much they can help us and how much they can do things. So what, we, what Jan Jin has done, who's a chemist that uh, migrated from Glaxo to, to UNC, we took the aripoprazole, which you probably have heard if you look at the national news, Abilify, the compound. We use this because it has some functional selectivity for the D2 arrestin pathway. And so we've made like hundreds of analogs of these compounds and have basically tested them to see, are they antipsychotic? Yes, they are antipsychotic. They basically inhibit the hyperactivity, as you can see in the dopamine transporter knockout. They inhibit hyperactivity that you can induce the model, the classical model of giving amphetamine, giving psychostimulants to animals that they start running around. Well, if you give them these antipsychotics, they basically, the activity is inhibited and their effect is arrest independent. So it means it's that target that we are targeting essentially. So we're kind of the, on the right track. So we've tested them 
for some of the partial, uh, some of the, the, uh, the side effects that they have is, and we find that these compounds essentially are devoid, just like our propazole, they're devoid of, anti, uh, of say, the cataleptic effect. And we're trying now to dial out some of the other side effects like the, the uh, diabetes and things like that. So I think this is indicate that we're on the right track. Now, at the beginning, I showed you we, we, wanted, we want to do the validation of this pathway. We want to know in animal model what it does and what the cells do, how the cells respond and things like that. So we, we need to have techniques essentially that we have a, a oops, sorry, we have a, we have a mouse here that is about that big. The brain is about a little bit smaller than the, the end of my thumb. And so you can see that the brain, as you know, has many, many different uh, sides, many different uh, 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 regions. And eventually, we want to get to the individual cells of this pathway. So here's the, probably this, the pathway that we're involved, which uh, the cells that synthesize dopamine are here, they project here, but they also talk to the cortex. So this is a, a real circuit, and, and you will see down with the other talks that are going to be presented that it's important to try to understand what the circuits are. So what we, we've done is that we've used genetic approaches and this is an approach that was uh, popularized by uh, three individuals that got the Nobel Prize in 2007, Dr. Smitties, Kopecky and Evans for basically taking an approach, I'm not going to go through this, but in, in the approach that they did was a very powerful approach and basically you can knock out by some genetic engineering uh, the genes in all the cells in the body if it exists in all the cells. Well, that's good. At the time it was really fantastic, but it's not really what we want to do because we want to go selectively in cells, not in only in, in, in regions of the, the brain, but in individual cells. So, other people have uh, invented a technique or came up with a, a technique where you can have a, a, a bacterial enzyme which recognizes small, small pieces of DNA. And in that way, if you express the, this enzyme, which is called the PRE, it's a recombinase enzyme, only in the red cells, you see that even though the gene is expressed in all the cells here, you will be able to delete them only in one cell, okay, in, in that cells that you've expressed the Cree. Now, it's been refined, and I think Dr. Disserot's gonna tell us about some of the techniques that he is using. So now we have techniques where we, we put several of these little addresses here, and things can flip around, and then now we can develop, we can knock out or knock in genes in only a single, a single type of cells, okay? So we're using some of this. And one of the approach, uh, Dr. Erse is gonna talk about some of the other approaches that we uh, are doing. But one of the approach that we are doing is that uh, one of the graduate students in the lab has done by mutations, taken the dopamine D2 receptors and mutated it. Uh, he's made over 600 mutations in these receptors where the receptors, sorry, this is, this is difficult. Uh, so uh, where the receptors can only couple to the conventional pathway or to the other pathway, this arrestin pathway. And what we want to do in this, to try to learn how is, what, what does it do behaviorally and what does it, does it recapitulate the effects of antipsychotic, we want to put them back in the cells where the dopamine receptors is, in the cells that we think are where the schizophrenic phenotype are, are involved. And so we have a whole bunch of genetic tricks that we're using. Uh, we have a, uh, a D2 which has these little addresses that the Cree can, can eliminate from a, a, a mouse that uh, has been shared with us by a colleague, Emiliana Borelli at the University of uh, uh, California. And basically we, we cross it with another mouse that has a selective Cree expression in one of the cells that we want to delete. And then we either then put the, these constructs, which can be the arrestin preferring, the G pro protein preferring, a dead construct or a wild type construct, back into the mouse. 
or we do it in a genetic way. And so we'll get then, we'll be able to test what these things are. And we're going to use this to test not only what the behavior is, but also whether our work, our, our antagonists that we're preparing, whether they work or not in, in the right way. And so we, we are also uh, putting even more uh, sophistication in this because we are trying to, uh, to couple this expression of the receptors with something which, is, which will allow us to know when the cell, the particular cells that we want to use in, say, the striatum is stimulated or inhibited, what kind of transcriptional, what kind of translational profile does it get? What genes are turned on? What's, what's the, 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 the anatomy of that receptor, of that cell is going to be? And so we've put some of these, uh, these things that we can isolate the message that is, that is synthesized uh, initially. And in that way, we'll be able to basically make a pattern or, or uh, of, of the genes that are expressed under various conditions and sort of try to understand, as you wish, as, as I said at the beginning, sort of discovered that, that silver bullet that causes some of these phenotypes. Now, uh, in conclusion, I think we have uh, shown that there's experimental evidence that this pathway uh, is downstream of the D2 receptors and pro probably involved in schizophrenia phenotype. Genetically engineered animal models that we've generated will provide much better tools to really do this very specifically. And the concept of functional selectivity at D2 receptors in the brain is an attractive one to provide more efficacious and, more importantly, with fewer side effects, antipsychotics, you know. And so the future direction that we, we have with this is that we're, we're using these newly engineered animal models to determine brain areas, circuits, pathways that provide the causal basis for schizophrenia phenotype or the effects of uh, antipsychotic, for example. And, and the translational analysis that I just mentioned at, at the end will help us also quite nice. The thing that we're excited in our effort with our colleagues at UNC to develop new compounds, new antipsychotics, is that the fact that we, we can take these functionally selective compounds and take them to the proof of concept because we're paired in with Pfizer, for example, that, and they are interested in this, okay? So things that we couldn't do in academia, we will eventually be able to do through them, essentially. So this is, this is quite interesting to us and, and quite hopeful. And so I think that's, uh, well, these are, the, some of the people that have done some of the work recently, um, these are people that started this work, lots of collaborators, but I would also say we have very nice support from NIMH, uh, as you see here, BBRF, I mean, I have benefited from BBRF, many people, many postdocs in my lab have had BBRF uh, found, or NARSAD funds, and I've had several family foundations that have uh, contributed to this as well as the Bundbeck Foundation. And I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Crow? Oh, st yes, yes, sir. St stand up and... Well, you see, we you started. Can repeat the question. So the, the question was, what type of new medication have we developed? Where uh, really we haven't developed any new medication. We're hoping to to develop new medications that have this these properties. But the the one that we started with, the aripiprazole, or the Abilify, as the backbone of to make hundreds and hundreds of compounds, is one that showed some functional selectivity for this arrestin pathway. So we're hoping, I mean, there's quite a bit of evidence that we have with the genetic models that if we do this, if we, if we develop a compound that can not totally activate this pathway, but activate it to maybe 25, 30% is while not inhibiting completely the other pathway, that will be the compound that we're looking for. And hopefully, 
And, and this may not come for the next three to five years or so, because as you know, it's, it takes a long time to develop drugs. But at least th this is why we're trying to do these, these genetic approaches, because we, we will be able to model what will happen if we activate the pathway halfway or inhibit the pathway halfway. And it will give us a readout, essentially, of what type of compound do we need to, to develop. So, uh, Dr. Carrell, yeah. uh, we hear a lot about <clears throat> personalized medicine now, especially yes. in cancer. Will the work that you're doing help us in psychiatry to have these individualized um, treatments that like we, we know of in, in some other medical fields? Well, uh, that, I mean, I would hope that we would be able to do this, but that's, uh, that's part of the initial challenge right. that I said, because the initial challenge is that, you know, cancer, uh, cancer you, cancers is often uh, cell-specific, and we can find what are the few mutations that mm -hmm. cause cancer, and they're usually at least two, sometimes three, well, in schizophrenia, it's a little more difficult, or depression, because we might have hundreds of genes. But the problem is that, you know, these hundreds of variants that have been found in, in the GWASP studies and things like that, we don't really know what is the importance of those, of those variants. Maybe there are a few variants sure. that are really, but we need, to, we need to, one, ask the question, how is it that the variants modify the activity of these genes? And two is we need to put them in models to see. And so this is why doing the right. transcriptional profile of these things, we, we hope that maybe we'll be identi able to identify these. And hopefully, that's what I call the silver bullet, that mm. we could essentially use you know, medication that are very targeted. Well, a, a couple more. This, so Eddie, and could we get the lights up a little bit between the yeah, It's hard to see from here. It's possible to do that, yeah. on the uh, little plaques putting in, in the body of your DNA. So they're getting more individualized with each one's schizophrenic. So uh, those companies, you keep saying Pfizer, but in Europe, Baxter and Amgen are working. Yes, I mean, okay. there, are, there are many companies that are interested <laughs> in this, yeah. Uh, the lady back there. Hi. And maybe I, just introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Marilyn Rickey. I, um, I was wondering if you know yet what kind of mode of transportation into the body. I mean, I, other than a pill, I, I think we need more things other than a pill. And would this maybe be um, something that could get into the body in a different way than a pill? Hmm. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the, the things that we're developing are basically the type, of, the, the type of things that would go in as a pill. I mean, it could be done as patches and things like that. I think you're probably referring to the hope of gene therapy, for example. Anything. Anything, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, this is kind of a schizophrenia. Some of the things that we, we have, and uh, Dr. Hurst has been, works on a project uh, in the lab, and we have hope that, that the principle that I just showed you might be interesting in also Parkinson's disease, where Gene therapy is probably more advanced, and so that's, uh, that'll be for another day. But uh, it, 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 the answer to our question is that we're thinking about this also. Okay, oh, 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 yes, ma'am. Cognition loss, is there any advances made there or any, any way you're targeting that with your medication? Well, uh, that, that's essentially the hope that we, we have with the model systems, is that they might allow us to better target, because many of the antipsychotics that were discovered or were developed up to now have not, have not included this in, in some of their, uh, their development principles, essentially. And so we, with the, the, the models that we have, that's why, you know, the dopamine receptors I talked to you, it's only, we, we're only targeting right now in the striatum, but they have dopamine receptors in the, in the cortex and things like that. So Dr. Hurst is, is trying to basically modify these receptors in just about every area of the brain to see exactly 
where do we have to target these, these receptors? Is it only in the striatum for locomotion or you know, the, the hallucination, or should we try to target them in, in the cortex? And so that's where, I mean, it's down in the future, but we, we're trying, we're cognizant of, of that. And that are you problem. also trying to do this pre-full-blown illness, like when someone's predisposed to possibly developing the illnesses? Uh, well, not yet. I mean, not yet. That's that's not. I mean, it's a little Good far from, from this. Yes. Okay. One one last question. Yes, sir. If you can stand up, sir, so we can hear you. The uh, G-protein CR. The G-protein CR is that described also in a human being? Uh, that's question one. And is there any role for ECT in combination with any of these medications? In, uh, mm. in, in uh, accelerating any effect. I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, maybe we should take this at the, at the uh, I'm not sure that I really get your questions, because I'm not familiar with what you're, you're talking about. In, in other words, the GCR that you describe, uh, is this also described in a human being? outside of a, you know, yeah, a human you mean model. the GPCRs that yeah. I'm using? Oh, yes. We, and we, the pathway is described yes. going across. Okay. Well, no, and ha has not been described biochemically, okay. but it's, it's presumably working there also because... Anatomically, uh, is it described? Yes. Going oh, across? the pathways are essentially the same in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in humans as it is in mice, you know. And ECT, ECT, is there anything where they've been used in conjunction with ECT? Uh, no, they, not, not, not the drugs that we're developing yet, no. Okay, no. thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Karam. Thank you. Very great way to start out. <laughs>